Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 56 of Relating to DevSecOps, where we explore the development, security, and operational issues of today so we can solve real-world problems with people that face them. I'm your host, Ken Toller, and I'm joined again by my co-host, Mike McCabe. Mike, how you doing today? We're recording during the day today, so more energy, yes. right? Yes, doing, doing well. Almost Friday. Almost there. Mike, you have a talk coming up uh, this weekend, right? Yep, I'm talking about my favorite thing at B B Sides NYC, uh, which is Terraform, Terraform Security, IAC. Uh, I will try to say IAC as many times as I possibly can on this. Do they call podcast. it? Do they call it IAC yet, or like? <laughs> no, I think they have laws against that, oh, okay. so okay. you can't you can't do that. <laughs> at least in New York. Got it. Yeah, you got to be careful what you say around here. Uh, so yeah, yeah up in, in, in my neck of the woods. So anybody that's uh, in New York uh, for that, please go heckle Mike. Uh, I'll I'll be there in the audience, um, hopefully raising questions and acting a fool. Um, so with with that out of the way, folks, please go and see it. I'm gonna try to get this episode posted in time to uh, so that this makes sense. Uh, this mm -hmm. intro. <laughs> So people don't show up next week. To yeah, that would be horrible. Um, yeah, so this is it's it's happening on the twenty second of April, twenty twenty three, Saturday, sometime in the afternoon. Check the schedule. Be there. Tickets are cheap, um, but the content is amazing. <laughs> uh, with that, uh, we are. On a different topic today, we are jumping into uh, something we've talked about before, um, but I think it was, Mike, before you joined, which was um, really incident response, which you've just recently brought up, uh, we were talking about a little bit before the show, inside of the world of DevSecOps and, and cloud and applications. Um, tell us a little bit about your view on incident response as it fits into DevSecOps. Yeah, I think um, you challenged me on this, which I think is good. But, uh, you know, people think of instant responses. How, how do you do log review? How do you figure out what happened after an incident? And that's like people don't think about it as a DevSecOps type of thing. You know, that's like, a, do we have logs and do we have Splunk and do we have people who know how to look for things there to figure out what happened? And do we know the number to our lawyer so we can figure out how much money we owe people? Um, those are kind of the things that people think about with IR, but I think that, um, you know, it is a, it is a larger DevSecOps organization team type of concern where people have to think about, um, how you do instant response end to end, not just, you know, do we have cloud trail turned on, but can we track things end to end? And actually I was looking at the OWASP, uh, cloud top 10, which they're slowly coming out with. And that's one of them, which I think is a good call out. Cause I don't think. AppSec in general has called out logging nearly enough. Um, and so that's always been kind of a, a weakness, I think, on the cloud side where, or sorry, on the app side where we don't have in-depth logging for apps. We don't know what's going on in apps besides like kind of the web server logs you get stock out of whatever framework you're using. Um, but yeah, I think, I think of it as a DevSecOps concern because you need to have that end-to-end -end logging and plan in place to actually figure out how you do instant response not just calling Mandiant and being like, solve all our problems for us at $600 or whatever they are at these days, uh, an hour. Yeah, it's it's something that I I sort of, I guess, waffle back and forth on when it comes to enabling logs. Because like you said, in, in applications, we, okay, not whether or not to enable logs, okay, for anybody that just got like, whose eyes came out of their head for that one. But it, but more like, how 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 far you go in terms of what you log because um and I, I still sort of struggle myself with with what to do depending on the size of the team and what to suggest and things like that but some folks will say give me all the logs all the noise because i would rather have everything when it comes to a response uh than to not have it and need it later which i get right that's definitely true but I think that given a limited size team, if you turn on all the logs, it probably takes them longer to get through some of those, some of the logging 
um, noise. And so it's it's really never useful until you get to like a post breach scenario or an incident scenario. So I'm always sort of waffling on that, like what's the most appropriate. Um, and I don't know that I have now a strong opinion, uh, you know, one way or another, other than kind of do do what's right in the situation. And for me, when I'm building up uh, like programs, it's easier for me to get a series of quick wins, especially on the consulting side, than it is to just turn on tools because people are so inundated with noise that it seems that that's kind of an approach that we take thinking that it's the best approach, but then we end up in situations where um, we can't handle all the information. Our team's not big enough. We don't have tools um, that are able to to sift through that noise. Do you have any opinions on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. It's kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of thing because you turn on all the logs and then where do you put them? You shove them in S3 because you don't have a Splunk license that can support, you know, three years of in-depth logging at every single service you have, cloud trail, cloud watch, access logs, object level logging. Like, yeah, no one has, no one has Splunk money like that. Um, <laughs> to, to That's the new entrepreneur to... money is, is the Splunk money. Yeah. If you're, if you have Splunk and it's, you know, not rotating logs every 30 days, you've got some good SV money. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I think that's always the challenge is knowing how, how much to log and how much you can afford to log. And then there's just stuff that gets shoved into cloud storage long term and Glacier. And then that's like, you can't use that for instant response until you figure out your timeline. Then you unwind those logs, pull them out of Glacier, get it loaded into something like Splunk, get it loaded into, um, you know, another log solution, Athena, whatever it is, and then start doing your instant response. I mean, I think there's kind of two sides to it. There's do you have a plan to do immediate instant response if you detect, uh, you know, ongoing activities right now? Um, I think you have to have as much logging as possible for those kinds of things and have your rules, have your IR team prep to kind of handle those things, have your cloud ops team, whoever it is who, you know, hands on keyboard can fix stuff. And then what's your plan if, um, you know, you get a report of some data being lost from some time period of how to do an instant response for that time period? How do you get those logs back out? What's going to be your method of of um, reviewing them, et cetera, et cetera? So I think you have to kind of view it in two different ways. Um, but I think pretty much everyone fails on this all the time, either from not being able to respond fast enough or not having enough historical data um, or both. Yeah, that's kind of like what's your goal? Or, you know, is your is your goal to respond or to investigate? It's it, I mean, it should be both, but um, what's your immediate priority? Because, and, and so that's why I say it's kind of depends on what you're looking to do. If you want to, if you want to get folks familiar with responding to incidents, it's, it's probably good to filter that information, even if you are logging it all. But I think you, you need to have either a way to filter that data or limit that data when you're first getting folks to respond to things, unless they're sort of a well-established team and have these, these playbooks available. But for the vast majority of startups and folks that are just sort of breaking ground on creating an incident response process or a, an incident response team, it may be better to try and filter that information down to be able to respond on things. Um, that kind of brings me to what we had originally started, like we've already gotten off track basically on, on, our, on our topic list, but um, you had mentioned um, that you were sort of looking at incident response in cloud and I did want to take that into how how we might look at it in in DevSecOps. But what what specifically are you um, are seeing in in your work in cloud incident response uh, that you want to sort of raise to the surface in terms of challenges that you faced or 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 worked through uh, in in the in twenty twenty three? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's a timeless timeless issue, but. I think the thing is when you when you get into instant response and we were doing one of these recently for an AWS customer it's like you when you start doing responses when you realize you don't have the logs you need to do the response so at that point it becomes like a guessing game and a best effort kind of thing so we were looking at um you know the attacker made a database public then how do you detect if that database was connected to okay well if you don't have audit logs turned on which you don't generally have those turned on, you might not see those connections. 
then how do you know if that attacker accessed the database or not? Um, so like most people aren't going to have auto logs turned on for every single database all the time because it's like an insane amount of of data you'd have to collect from just your databases. So it's kind of one of those things where you're always what we were saying before you're always trying to balance between having enough and not not uh, overloading your logging systems or your you know storage. But I think I think people don't realize. Like if you don't have the logs, you don't have the logs. There's no going back in time and like clicking that box. And so at that point, if you don't have it, you're just putting together a best guess as to what happened. Um, and that's not very fun because your estimate of data loss could be super small or super huge based on, you know, how much time the the attacker had in your systems to to access things. So um that's why we always in security shy on the side of being just cautious and having you know as much logs as possible so you don't get into that situation but obviously there's limits to that so um that's what i've been kind of dealing with and thinking about and um even with the terraform talk i've i've been talking about is i talk about some some techniques you can use from a malicious perspective in terraform and again if you're not if you don't have in-depth logs turned on you're not going to see what happened and once those activities are you know performed like your chance to log that is done and if you don't have it, you don't have it. Yeah. What do you think are the most important categories of logs to have? So if I was going to say, because you were just saying, it, let's say that you had to place a constraint on your logs, whether it's from storage or cost, or um, you just feel like there's too many, too many logs. I think, I, I think that um, just to set the record straight, I think we both agree that there's no such thing as having too many logs. But there probably is such a thing as um, dealing with too many logs. Um, yeah, I don't know if, if that makes sense. But to me, it's like you can easily be overwhelmed by the amount of information if it's not filtered or um, structured in a, in a consumable way. I think you can have too much to dig through. So if you were going to say, hey, like, here are the top things that you should be logging if you have to make some sort of concession or constraint. What do you think those would be in cloud? I mean, obviously the number one is, you know, your cloud activity log. So like cloud trail is that that's, you know, the very, very basics. You have to have that turned on. Um, but I think I, th I think about it in the sense of figure out, have a log turned on so you can figure out what happened in every system. So if that means your app, make sure your app logs are detailed enough. So, you know, like, what controller got passed in maybe the variables even though that that has its own you know if you log payloads that means sensitive data gets logged so that's has its own issues but at least be able to tell what happened in your application be able to tell you know where it came through um database same thing be able to tell you know what what connected to it when from what location um and kind of at each layer of your stack kind of view it that way so you can be able to tell at each layer what what actually went on, um, which can turn out to be a lot of logs. So, uh, but a lot of the stuff you wouldn't need unless something happens. Cloud Trail is something you want to have turned on and monitoring all the time, just because that's how you track so many malicious activities. But certain things like database logs, you might not care about until there actually is an incident. So you might not need that loaded into Splunk or Elk, whatever you have running all the time. Yeah. Or even just knowing that there's an incident <laughs> that occurred. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I it, the way that you describe it almost sounds like uh, as you're going through each component, you're kind of threat modeling it out yourself. You know, it's it's you're kind of saying who you know who who has done this thing or or what has happened and in what system, and I think that really what folks look for when they're sort of engaging with a new cloud service is what what the logging capability is i think the best practice is always turn on cloud trail and turn on cloud watch but the the biggest hurdle um i see folks go through is that when they enable cloud watch it's like okay i've enabled cloud watch now what so um if we're talking if we're sort of uh, focusing in on aws is that something that you have like a best practice on folks can think about like, okay, when you enable CloudWatch, look for these kinds of things and these kinds of services or how does someone use CloudWatch versus CloudTrail? I mean, cloud, it depends on what you're trying to do. If you're looking for cloud specific activities, like, okay, the root key gets used. 
you can use something like CloudTrail to to detect that kind of stuff or a new user gets added or you know you have you have account login failures or privilege escalation attempts things like that like that's common stuff you see people use CloudTrail for um i mean cloudwatch logs it depends on what service it is those can usually be more in depth per service but you might i haven't seen too many people too many people who have service specific indicators um for every single thing like are you going to see uh, like elastic cash dumping all of its data that could be a malicious user of someone just being like dump everything out of memory um but you know are people do they have ir alerts for that not many people have that kind of stuff in place so it's usually been more responsive to know um you know that it happened or how it happened afterwards than having that kind of stuff being monitored all the time i mean i think people still struggle with the basics when it comes to monitoring and alerting so you know, I wouldn't say go for anything too esoteric until you have that stuff nailed down and you have super fast response times or automated response where you don't actually have to do anything. Um, so yeah, I think if you're to the point where you're doing individual service IR alerts, then you're probably in pretty good shape. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that that's kind of my frustration with logging and monitoring. Um, in general is is try and you know ir as a practice is not really my specialization but i like to think about i like to think about it in a, in a way that of like sort of what my personal experience is with it and i've faced that right where it's like everyone says turn on cloud trail it's very easily consumable but one of the gaps that i'm I, that i always really see is that cloud trail and these these sort of one button click um log enablement give you uh, give you some of the basics, right? It gives you um, what you should be looking at, uh, um, not even holistically, that's your word. Uh, <laughs> that is, uh, but is, is like in a general sense, right? What are the things that the service or that is being done in the cloud? We can write automation associated with this because these are very predictable, generic events that happen with anyone using the service when is this permission used or how is this specific thing used but as soon as you get into like the business case of like things that are deployed specifically on an ec2 instance or how an application like what what uh i don't know if, if cloudtrail does this i can't remember but like if somebody hits up a specific endpoint in an api gateway and some code is executed in the lambda like whether or not we should be on the lookout for anything specific within the author you know the authentication structure or the the function that's actually occurring in that function th that's where it starts to get more meaty like you'd probably have more interesting information if you were logging things in a compelling way in those functions and maybe i'm i don't know i'd love your opinion here maybe i'm overthinking it it's just i i feel like i would want to know um as an example uh if someone is hitting my uh API endpoint on my API gateway from a specific country at a specific time to do some analytics on that than I am necessarily if someone was act you know just executing a permission or if a EC2 instance got rebooted or something like that. I would just want more specific things to the business because those I feel are the most compelling for uh for folks. And it's I just don't think we think enough through what we should actually be using inside of even CloudTrail or CloudWatch or what we should be enabling when we're looking at um, different applications or application infrastructures. Uh, it's a bit of a ramble, but I don't know. Does that make <laughs> sense? Like, Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I get what you're, I get what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, I think like um, it goes back to what you're saying. It, you have to, to do a threat model on each kind of service or each application or each even application feature. So like if you have a coupon uh, redemption API and you just see some random person start hammering it and iterating through the numbers or just, you know, sending random data into it to try to find a coupon, you know, that would be something you'd alert on based on that threat model of like, okay, someone's going to try to abuse this API to try to get coupons or discounts, whatever. Um, and so, yeah, you have to have kind of individualized alerting based on your threat model and then also just kind of generalized attacks that you would see against any service. Um, I think the problem is those are all like building those really high fidelity, high, like very fine tuned alerts is great. I just think it's really hard for people to 
get to that point. I think people still struggle with the basics. Like, are most people able to respond in five minutes if they see the root key used? You know? Yeah. Like, more than likely, they have a delay of 10 or 15 minutes waiting for CloudTrail to report that to S3 so they can adjust that to their Splunk. So then the Splunk alert can fire off. Um, you know, I think people just struggle with the basics. So they don't see they don't see those abuses until afterwards. I mean, maybe someone will someone will, you know, bring it up like a QA person might see errors in the error tracking system and be like, hey, we're seeing a bunch of errors from this IP. Can someone look into it? But that's not an instantaneous thing. That's not a quick response yeah. at that point. The damage can be done. So I think to a degree, we also don't think enough about monitoring things that we've discovered. Like, how many times do you go through like a CSPM engagement or a an application security engagement where there's a vulnerability and folks remediate the vulnerability, but they don't write any logging or monitoring to to figure out whether or not it happens again or if it if they can do anything to prevent that in the future. I think we miss yeah. that feedback loop so often. I mean, also guilty, right? Um, that it's it becomes like we probably could build on top of the logging and monitoring and get beyond the fundamentals if we just took that one extra step every time we remediated a finding or created an observation. Yeah, this is some, something that it reminds me of something we did way back in the day, actually, when you and me used to work together at Living Social, but... On the AppSec side, we used to write regression rules for every uh, bug that was found. Like a cross-site scripting found at this endpoint, write a, you know, write a test to send a cross-site scripting payload either as a unit test or as a regression test, and then check and see if, um, you know, basically have that fail if uh, that ever pops back up. And it's funny that you know you actually would see those fail here and there because someone fixed it, but then the fix got reverted or something like that. So it was a really interesting, interesting thing to do and to see actually work um but yeah the same thing from an awarding side like okay we know this bad thing happened let's set up an alert specifically for that so that going forward we always know immediately and you know you have your playbook your ir team as well trained about who to you know who to call um or even have an automated response that does it for you i think that'd be that'd be a great way i unfortunately think a lot of people do their after action report and they're like, all right, job done, moving on to the next crisis. And these kind of, this kind of proactive reactive stuff doesn't get built out enough, but that's a good idea. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I think if people could solve the basics and I think the good thing, at least in the cloud arena is that some of this so many of these things you can solve relatively easily like with cloud trail cloud watch cloud watch um metrics and alerts you can get you know i gotta say 90 percent. you can get a good chunk of your uh security alerts that you need um cis has a whole list of okay alerts you should set up and have um there's obviously a lot more you should have in place and there's a lot that are noisy like they recommend things like alerting on subnet changes or alerting on security group changes but that's obviously any medium to large size environment is going to be way way too noisy to have any kind of um you know good signal out of those kind of alerts but there's a lot of other ones root key usage obviously is a huge one um new users new policies you know it depends on how you have your whole system structured of you can use these kind of alerts but you can do it for free. That's a good thing, is my point. Yeah. Or nearly free. Yeah. I mean, and there are, I mean, I was, we were, we were sort of talking earlier about whether or not we even approach the topic of SOAR um, as a potential, you know, I think we might be able to dig more into incident response using that as an element. I'm usually hesitant to talk about it because, um, and I haven't looked at it in a while, but I remember the marketing material when when it came out was like the magic security pill for incident response. And but I what I like about it was the idea that you could create automation in response, which um, you know is is kind of one of those the the DevSecOpsy way of looking at incident response is that if something occurs, you can automatically sort of respond to it. And there are free, mm -hmm. you know. Um, tools for SOAR to experiment with that as well. We were talking about one uh, electric guy um, uh, before we got on to the recording uh, to review. So I think it's, it's um, 
it's really interesting to think about like how this stuff all fits together. And that's where I want to hopefully close this out is we've talked about, um, you know, the different things that you can do in cloud to create uh, logs for yourself, whether or not you should sort of err on the side of too many logs or, or sort of more, I liked your word, high fidelity uh, um, logging mechanisms that give you, you know, what you need at a point in time so that you can respond effectively. But then the other piece is, you know, cloud infrastructures give you this framework with which to operate in and give you a lot of good metrics to start with, or not metrics, but good logs to start with and good information to start with. But how, you know, what do you find is missing in sort of this um, end-to-end observability for incident response when it comes to like, you know, seeing that request come in uh, you know, over over the web or into your public endpoint and tracing that through your system and being able to respond at any given point or have a relevant log at any given point. Any major gaps you see or that or common themes that you see in that that you'd want to call out? I mean, I think it's, uh, I think about it sort of like source code review where you think about it source to sync where, where did the, where did the request come from and where did it end up? And can you basically log at each one of those levels to see how each system, the first one and the last one, reacted to that input? So, you know, do you see it coming through CloudFront to your API gateway to, you know, your Lambda? Um, Then do you see how the application responds to it? Again, we get into the point where we're vlogging an incredible amount and then you just have too much to kind of sort through. But um you know, I think the I think what people should do is is look threat model and kind of do a tabletop response to say, okay, can we can we actually log if something like this happened? Can we figure out what happened? Do we have the level of logging at each level that we need without going overboard to actually say, okay, SQL injection, remote cut execution, authorization issue, um, you know, privilege key gets lost, all those different kind of scenarios and say, okay, go end to end. Do we see when this kind of thing happens? Um, and if not, try to address those gaps. Um, I mean, I don't know if that really addresses your answer. I think I think the cloud providers give us a pretty good amount of information to to use, maybe too much information, too many services. So then it's kind of a pick and choose and people do a bad job of, of doing that. Um, but I think you have to kind of go back to the threat model and what what is the risk that you're trying to detect or react to. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that the threat modeling piece is incredibly important um, to understand what you should be looking for out of your logs. So at least to generate indicators of whether or not an incident has occurred or where to start when when it comes to um, trying to figure out what had happened or or whether an incident has occurred. Um, you mentioned source to sync. I like that that thought process because that will that kind of takes you through the the model of like where is the data persisted or in and like where along this this area can you can something be done and if you're identifying threats i think folk the reason folks have trouble threat modeling sometimes is because they're focused on looking for vulnerabilities not necessarily on potential threats right so it's like you we're not looking for vulnerabilities just because you've solved for something or that you don't think it can happen doesn't mean it's not a threat and so one way that you can get over that hump is probably to think about how would you detect if that happened? And could you put some sort of, you know, uh, mechanism, mechanism in place to, uh, to detect that? And that way you're not really looking for the vulnerability, but really just what the detection might look like for you so that you're not just focused on, um, you know, these overly complex ways of detecting things. Um, one of the areas I think that we didn't really talk about that we had addressed in one of the previous episodes was an inventory of what you actually have. So in order to do to accomplish the task that you're talking about is you need to understand how these components at both, we talked about it at like a high level the con- that we talked about application constellations and application inventory. Um, but you're not, you don't even, you don't have necessarily have to, you have to know not only how these things fit together on a conceptual level, But in the areas that you're talking about, you also have to understand them at the infrastructure level. So the things that we were talking about potentially ignoring in the application inventory conversation around not ignoring, but just like not necessarily thinking about in that context was, you know, if you have an application, you don't necessarily need to know how many containers in the Kubernetes cluster make up this application. 
But in this case, you kind of do have to because you want to know where to go in order to resolve this issue or what 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 thing to kill or or whatever because it's not necessarily looking at it from a defense standpoint, but from a react you know reactivity reaction standpoint response standpoint. Um, so it's kind of made me think a little bit about you, you do need both and sort of where you, where do you focus depending on what you're looking for. Yeah, I think the word uh, you don't want to say, but I think fits well as having a holistic view of <laughs> yeah, these things. <laughs> exactly. The the holistic view for for incident response. Yeah, yeah. Um that that does bring us to our our half hour. I think um lessons I take away from this is is really uh when thinking about maybe not lessons but just like uh, observe uh, observe observations observations is what I was going to say, but observations. There you go. Yeah. Uh, I can do words. Um, the, the one is the threat modeling aspect of it, which is kind of use that as a tool with which to, to figure out what you should be looking for and how to respond to it. Um, the second is, uh, this in order to like figure out how to create observability in your application. So if you're, if you're looking at things like cloud trail and you're just turning them on and hoping for the best, that's probably not the best approach, but if you start to enable things like CloudWatch and you start to force yourself to think of what you should be looking for so that you can create observability into the uh, into like the business functions that you're talking about, like that would be, that's kind of a, a cool place to go. And then also just highlighting again, things I haven't looked at in a while, which was like electric eye, SOAR, open source tooling um, that you can, you can really take advantage of or at least start experimenting with if you don't have the budget for, for the things that are marketed to you or advertised towards you. It's just, always be looking for those open source alternatives just to get your feet wet with a particular practice like SOAR or, um, or incident response. What yeah. About you? I really like, uh, I like cloud custodian too, which is another free tool. It's not really, it's not an IR tool. It's more of a, uh, th the prevention mechanism for misconfigurations, but it works kind of in the same way as what a SOAR would do as in fixing issues when it detects it. So, <clears throat> that's a great way to prevent you know misconfigurations in your cloud environment um and also free and free is great free is good and not and not necessarily bad these days uh i think free can be yeah. very 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 good uh in the right hands um any any closing comments or thoughts as my uh as my lovely canine friend barks in the background the, the joys of of day recording yeah yeah i mean i i think um people just need to take a step back and again it goes to i think threat models are a great way to to get a view of what you should be doing here um but take a step back and view their environment and make sure that they can do that end to end kind of instant response if something were to happen um and don't make assumptions that hey uh, well we're logging this here we're logging this there like we have that covered but really do a thorough investigation to make sure that they can understand um if something did go wrong, what happened, who did it, when, all those types of things. So I think everyone should be doing that on a pretty regular basis. And hopefully if they're threat modeling, that's part of their outputs of their threat model too. So, Absolutely. 100% agreed. Um, well, that wraps it up for this episode, episode number 56. Uh, keep an eye out for more. Uh, as we bring in guests, we have a couple of folks we are, uh, we've already engaged with and, and started to schedule time with. Um, that are non-security people uh, that may or may not be unfamiliar with um, with the the world of security and DevSecOps. So I think we'll have some really interesting conversations coming up uh, in the near future with those folks. Uh, as always, thank you for listening. If you want to reach out to us, you can uh, hit us up at security at r2dso.com, on Twitter at r2dso, uh, or you can um, you know leave a comment on our on any podcast page we we monitor those as well um and thank you for listening and we'll see you next time